Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. This evening's show is part of our Legislative Issues series hosted by Jim Parisi. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly to your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we're going to talk about an important issue, an important issue for workers, for employers, and for the state in general, and that is related to the issue of misclassification of workers. Joining us, we have a, uh, an esteemed panel of three individuals, Senator Josh Miller. Josh represents uh, the, the eastern part of Cranston and uh, is a Rhode Island Senator and also Chair of the Corporations Committee. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Okay. Also, uh, Richard Sinopi. Dick, you are a, a lobbyist. Uh, you do government affairs work for contractors in the state of Rhode Island, among other things, as an attorney. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Glad, glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. And Scott Tuhamel with the Painters Union, where you're a business agent as well as Secretary Treasurer of the Building and Construction Trades here in Rhode Island. Thanks for joining us, Scott. Nice to be here, too. Okay. Uh, Scott, let me uh, stick with you. Just uh, give our viewers a quick background on who belongs to the Building and Construction Trades Council here in Rhode Island. Who do you represent? Well, there's 15 different affiliates, as you might imagine, ranging from the plumbers to the iron workers, the painters, the laborers, the glazers, and on and on and on. We're, we're a group that's been together for um, probably over 80 years. Uh, we meet twice a month and we try to solve the industry problems and, and try to uh, acquire work and we try to further uh, our memberships, uh, work opportunities, etc. Okay. And your organization's very involved in legislative issues every year, aren't you? Yes, we are. We're up there as much as possible. A variety of us are up there. A few of us are up there more than the rest and okay. uh, we do our best to try to make things better. Terrific. Dick, you represent contractors. Could you describe the organization that you represent and, and what has been your role as it relates to lobbying for them this past session? Uh, I represent the Rhode Island Associated General Contractors. Those are the major signatory contractors in the state. They do all the major construction, uh, Rhode Island-based construction, uh, Cardi, Berman, uh, Gilbane, um, uh, Lucy, uh, and the like, uh, Marshall, uh, all those major contractors. I also represent the New England Mechanical Contractors Association. Those are major signatory mechanical contractors. Again, Rhode Island based. They do a lot of the major work in the state of Rhode Island. They both also, both Nemker and uh, Rhode Island AGC, are also uh, two of the partners in uh, the Bill Rhode Island uh, organization, uh, which uh, is which the building trades, uh, construction trades are also part of. Uh, as to the legislation, uh, I was a co-author of, uh, of the legislation that we're going to be talking about, and I obviously worked very hard uh, to try to get it passed, uh, including the compromises and what have you uh, that was necessary to get everything done. Terrific, and uh, we appreciate having you here with all the expertise you have with us. Senator, you were uh, a sponsor of one of these uh, important pieces of legislation of this year. Could you just briefly describe why you introduced a bill related to the misclassification of workers? Our former leader, uh, Dennis Connors, uh, Dan Connors, um, was the sponsor of legislation that created a commission to study the issue in 2009. And through watching the procedures of that commission and listening to Leader Connors, I got um, very involved in the issue and understood it as a fairness issue, not only for employees that were misclassified, but also for contractors to create a level playing field. Terrific. Uh, before we get into the legislative story, I know there was more than one piece of legislation related to this issue that passed this year. And Dick, if you could take a few minutes and give us a rundown on all the different legislative changes that were enacted by the General Assembly this year. There were four bills, and, I th and the reason why they're related, all of them attempt to level the playing field so that compliant, law-abiding contractors uh, can operate and compete fairly and not be driven out of business by those who don't pay 
prevailing wage or don't pay minimum wage or don't pay overtime or skirt paying any wages at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or they uh, designate people, everybody as an independent contractor and thereby avoid paying payroll taxes, workers' compensation insurance, withholding taxes on behalf of the employee. That hurts the employee because the employee is now eligible for TDI, they're now eligible for unemployment. It hurts the state because they don't get the payroll taxes, workers' compensation insurance doesn't get the funding, uh, and uh, ultimately my employers, my co compliant contractors uh, can't compete as well as other contractors out there who are compliant. So these four bills are all related to attempts to improve enforcement so that uh, it's a level playing field and everybody's playing by the rules. Uh, the major bill that was passed was a private right of action misclassification bill. It has several components. The first component was modifying the existing administrative procedure uh, for any wage and hour violation. You could file a complaint with the DLT and go through that process. The problem with that process was that if the employer got whacked, they paid a 25% penalty. Uh, and there was testimony uh, that we heard before the uh, uh, House and Senate Labor, uh, uh, Josie uh, from uh, Fuerza Laboral, the executive director, um, uh, testified how she would represent you know, in, uh, workers all the time who were not getting paid. And they'd see the employer come in time and again and they would just pay the wages and they'd pay a 25% penalty. They didn't care. So there was a real sense that the penalty was inadequate to prevent the abuses from happening. Did not deter these uh, non-compliant employers. Clearly that was the uh, testimony and evidence. So one component is to increase administrative penalties to, two, to up to two times all wages and benefits are owed, plus a 12% uh, interest penalty, plus council fees. Now the other component of that is that the penalty would be shared equally with the injured worker, I mean not the injured worker, the, uh, uh, the worker, and the DLT. Why? And add an incentive for a worker to come forward. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, they, all, they only owe me 500 bucks, 800 bucks, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, you may get a penalty of double that if there's a, a double penalty. You may get half that. So maybe it's more incentive for the employee to come forward. Another component of the bill which is significant is a private right of action. There is now in Rhode Island, unequivocally, in dispute before, but now there is unequivocally a private right of action to collect uh, wages uh, or uh, overtime wages, minimum wages uh, that may be owed to you. Again, you have the same penalties up to twice all wages and benefits owed plus council fees. In a private right of action, uh, the employee gets to keep everything. Again, now there's great incentive for employee to go into a uh, private right of action and there's an incentive for the attorney to go after it because the attorney is going to get council fees. Prior, so to, prior to having a private right of action, um, who had the authority to, to move on these violations if there was an alleged violation of the wage and hour laws? It depends who you talk to. Uh, there were two federal judges in the state who said that there was no private right of action under uh, state law. There was one or two that says there was. Uh, in state court, usually they said there was, but there was some ambiguity, to be honest with you. Um, but this unequivocally sets it forth. Uh, it provides for a three-year statute of limitations, and I think the council fee is big because now there's incentive to bring these cases. Employers know that they're not going to have to pay a 25% penalty. They could get whacked for twice the wages owed plus council fees. Uh, so now they know there's incentive for the employer to, employee to bring it. There's incentive for attorneys to represent them. Uh, hopefully, this will be a strong deterrent in the future. And remember when there is a wage and hour violation, this is addition to any other penalties they may owe. I mean, if they owe workers' comp, or they owe uh, uh, payroll taxes, or they owe unemployment contributions, and they got to do that in addition. Um, and and not, uh, there were uh, other pieces of this legislative package as well. Why don't you touch on those three, and then, and then we'll talk more about the misclassification bill. Uh, you know what we talk about misclass now? Um, don't get too excited, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure you, you touch on the other ones before I ask these two gentlemen um, uh, you know, about the misclassification. There's more pieces to the misclassification bill that you haven't touched on yet, I gather. I haven't touched on the misclass bill at all. And this class bill is a key component, and that is that, as you know, before in Rhode Island, if you misclassified an employee and you got caught, well, maybe the division of taxation would make you pay, you know, the payroll taxes, the DLT maybe make you pay, you know, unemployment contribution. Uh, that you owed, 
uh, or what have you. But and the worker, if they were getting minimum wage, wouldn't get anything, and there was really no incentive for the worker to come forward. Right. And again, this harms my guys because everybody's an independent contract except my guys that get paid, who are paying prevailing wage and are paying all the benefits and payroll taxes. Well, now there is a significant penalty from five hundred to three thousand dollars per employee qualified, uh, miscla misclassified for a first offense. Also, there's council fees. In addition, that penalty in an administrative action is shared between the DLT and the employee. Also, it provides for council fees. Once again, giving incentive for the employee to come forward. Now they get, now they got something out of this class. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get a penalty, uh, which could be significant. Additionally, uh, there's a private right of action that I just described, also applies to the misclassification scenario. Major, major deterrent now in the misclassification uh, area. Uh, that, uh, the only other thing in, in this big omnibus bill was the uh, uh, whistleblower statute was incorporated as the anti-retaliation provisions mm -hmm. for bringing a misclass or, or a wage and hour claim uh, under this section. That's an important component because I imagine workers are hesitant about um, making a claim for fear that they're going to get retaliated against by losing a job or, or not getting called back to work just for enforcing their rights under law. Absolutely, and the whistleblower statute in and of itself doesn't always apply to anti-retaliation depending on the, on the context. Here we expressly said, if you retaliate for any of these, uh, you get these uh, protections mm -hmm. of the Whistleblower Act. Terrific. So that's the major bill. The other three bills are minor, but they kind of su they help support the whole concept of promoting enforcement and deterrence. One of them is the uh, um, Contractors Registration Board uh, bill that requires, requires the Contractors Registration Board to uh, revoke or suspend uh, the uh, certification of any employer that has outstanding wage and hour uh, determination uh, uh, owed uh, to employees per uh, DLT determination. Uh, that's significant because now it is a big deterrent. You can't just go on business, okay, I, DLT says I owe this money, I don't care, I'll just go out and keep, keep doing jobs mm -hmm. and what have you. Now the contractor's registration is going to be revoked. Not only that, it applies to any successor entity. So if that individual or any other individual was part of that entity that was certified, tries to open up, uh, get another certification, it also applies to them. Uh, it also, uh, uh, it has an innocent owner component too if there, somebody in the organization was innocent. But again, that's a significant change uh, to business as usual. Uh, additionally, there is a sharing of information bill that requires a DLT to share information uh, with the uh, Division of with, Taxation. Uh, with, the, with the DOA, and I think the DL, DL, Division of Ta Taxation to share information with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, DLT. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is all to, uh, in the course of investigating uh, suspected misclassification uh, wage and hour violations. And, and um, why shouldn't different government agencies be talking to each other? Right? Is, is the obvious observation? Well, sadly, they often don't, but mm -hmm. usually a cheater is a cheater across the board, as we've discovered, and that's why this is an important element. Yeah, and a lot of them interpret uh, federal and state confidentiality provisions to prevent that. This now overcomes that by statute. It does have one floor. It provides that you have to have probable cause to share this information. One of the problems is we're trying to promote sharing of information for other reasons, again, at the request of these agencies who, who uh, express that to us. For instance, the DOA is considering a, a contractor on a public works bid uh, to see their qualifications uh, for the, uh, for the uh, bid. They may call the DLT and say, look, is there any outstanding uh, claims for prevailing wage or wage and hour uh, violations against this particular contractor? Well, you could construe this statute to say, well, unless you're investing, you have probable cause investigating a violation, we can't give that to you. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of one of the unintended consequences, which may have to tweak this bill. Obviously, that information I can get. Okay. Sure. I mean, I can request that information. Mm -hmm. um, the final uh, bill is the uh, Access to Public Records Act. It's kind of a fix that we did because uh, a change last year that directed all certified payrolls on public works projects. Uh, to be uh, filed not with the DLT as they have been uh, from uh, time immemorial, 
to the actual awarding authorities. The DLT would only get to certified payrolls if they were investigating a potential prevailing wage violation. As everybody knows, certified payroll is on public works projects where you have to pay prevailing wage, you have to put you know, the individual, the wage, the class they're in, and all that to show that they are getting the prevailing wage required on a public works contract. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's one of the ways that there's private enforcement. You, you could request those information from the DLT, and you could check that against another bill we got passed last year, mm -hmm. the daily log, to see if that person is logged in and see right. if that person is properly cl classified and getting proper wages. Uh, the problem is that once they started turning these over to the, uh, to the awarding authorities, URI and Rick decided their interpretation is different than the DLT. They decided that these are not public records. They've got personal financial information. Mm -hmm. We're going to redact them. Now it makes you know getting certified payrolls uh, uh, of no consequence, and it totally thwarts the daily lie, totally thwarts private you know, efforts for private enforcement. So the quick fix we got was very simply to make it clear on the Access to Public Record uh, Act that certified payrolls uh, submitted to awarding authorities are public records uh, under the Act and therefore are available. So those are the four components uh, and sort of interrelated to try to get at and deter cheating. Certainly sounds like a, a whole uh, set of um, strong enforcement measures that are going to allow individuals and not reliant solely on the state government to enforce rights and enforce the law. I could see, I could see how important this issue is, not just for workers, but for, for businesses as well. Um, and Scott, let me turn to you. Um, I, I know you represent workers, but uh, there was a business interest in, in this legislation as well. Could you describe uh, your organization's involvement with uh, the different employers on this bill? Well, we work hand in hand with um, the contractors who are signatory or union, obviously, every day. And we feel, um, you know, it's a sad and unabashed truth that almost in the construction, the field of construction, every day in this state, Every week, every month, people are cheating. Whether they're cheating in prevailing wage or they're just cheating their employees, it happens all the time. We know this. We all have organizers. All the organized, uh, all the unionized building trades have organizers go out to jobs, both unionized and non-unionized, and speak to workers. And we find this happening daily, all the time. And obviously, our contractors suffer because when they put in a legitimate bid on a legitimate project, they are undercut all the time with those who aren't going to pay the wages that they promised or the wages even that the state dictates they should pay, which is a prevailing wages. So we found this is a constant problem. You mentioned before about a whistleblowing. We call it job scared. Oftentimes, you'll meet someone and they'll say, I was promised this. I was promised to be paid on a certain day. I was given this, I didn't get it. And we say, you step forward. They say, well, I will, but I'll lose my job. And there are no other jobs right now. Right. And we fully understand that. So, you know, it's, it works for both, both the, um, the management side and for the worker side. And in the long run, even though this was driven by union efforts, this is for legitimate contractors, both open shop, which is non-union, and, and also union shops, who pay what they say they're going to pay and what they're, what they're required to pay. So we feel this levels the playing field for those who play it legally, officially, and pay workers what they're promised they should be paid. Certainly. Senator, uh, you spend a lot of time talking with your colleagues about a whole host of legislative issues. Uh, you, were, you were a prime mover on this misclassification issue this year. Uh, what were the conversations you had with your colleagues and your leaders in the in the Rhode Island Senate about yep. this bill, and it wasn't only colleagues and leaders. It was about it was taxpayers and why this is so important, not only to legislators but to taxpayers throughout the state. It is it is estimated. I think the Northeast average is about six percent of workers are misclassified. That means that six percent of the workers in the workplace are not paying the full range of workers' comp, payroll tax, Social Security all those revenue sources for a state. And one of the reasons Rhode Island is in the situation financially that it's in is because of our high unemployment rate. Fewer people paying into these programs and these funds. If you do, if you recover through this legislation even 1% rather than 6% of the lost wages and the lost payroll taxes, you have an economic incentive for the state of $12 million per year. Mm -hmm. That's 1% of six. So you multiply that by six, you have $72 million. That is close to about 
two-thirds of the deficit that we had this mm -hmm. year in the budget that we had to either uh, pick up through cuts to programs or additional revenue through additional taxes. So there's a huge incentive for the state to be involved in the enforcement of these, of these laws that are available now through this act. And that must have rung very true with uh, the legislators in, in the General Assembly. Everybody on the has an act. interest in, a, in preserving a certain program or not allowing for a certain tax increase, one or the other. And if you create an incentive, I think it was, it was brought to my attention by Scott through conversations um, of how effective this was in Massachusetts in the first year of similar legislation being enacted and the empowerment of the departments that did the investigation, $16 million in the first year alone when Massachusetts was able to aggressively go after those who are misclassifying workers. So it can have an incredible impact, not only for workers and contractors who are trying to even the playing field to those who are playing fair, but to every taxpayer. This is, can jumpstart what we would look for when we, when we uh, look at uh, doing something about our unemployment mm -hmm. rate. And so it really creates revenue that employment creates before employment accelerates. And because this bill is, is um, uh, provides for a private right of action, you don't have to hire hundreds of state workers to press investigations. The industry is really going to investigate itself. The industry can do itself. a lot. You, it, one of the problems with any program that creates a burden for an understaffed state agency, and every agency will say they're understaffed with a cut of about 18% of state workers of, since Kacheri um, really slashed and burned state workers and made less effective, fewer resources, is that they do need partners whenever they can in investigative efforts or these types of efforts. And this creates revenue for their department or for the state to properly enforce as this goes along. Mm -hmm. Uh, when are all these changes effective, and when do you think we're going to start seeing uh, em employers, the, the bad actors, if you will, change their behavior here in Rhode Island? Well, they were effective on passage, and I think they get signed at different times. I think it was the end of June of this year they were signed by the governor. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all effective right now. I think there's obviously going to be some lag uh, between when... Uh, attorneys and uh, workers realize that there's these additional tools and incentives to come forward. Um, so there is some lag. I'm also on the Board of Governors for the Ryan Association of Justice. I've tried to explain to them and, you know, educate them on the existence of this. But it's going to take a while to get out there to all the trial lawyers and to the workers. So, I mean, there's definitely going to be some lag, some education lag on the fact that you have these rights and these incentives to come forward. Uh, additionally, you're going to have to get some judgments, some determinations, mm -hmm. and maybe some publicized ones before a lot of these employers who, you know, they got their own way of doing business, which is not the right way. They don't pay attention, and they just keep doing it the wrong way, and they don't care what's going on until they see somebody gets whacked for a major judgment uh, for misclassification or wage and hour violation. Then they may take some note, and then they look at the attorney's fees component, uh, and then they may take some notice. So I think there's going to be a lag time, uh, to be sure. Uh, but then it's it's up to us to. I think you might see, see you might see something earlier than a case that is prosecuted. You might see an awarding of government construction contracts. The fact that when they look at who was awarded a contract, look at how much private um, contracting was going on in that, how much potential misclassification was with that contractor. And there'll be some, a closer look and something to do about the reputation and the, and the procedures of that contractor mm -hmm. so that people who were more likely to do what this law is trying to prevent will stay away and, they'll ha and the other contractors will have the ability to point out that this contractor has regularly been awarded this type of contract because of his misclassification and our inability to go after that misclassification. So there might be more scrutiny and um, better results for government contracts on construction. Sure, I could see how that might trigger things yeah. fairly quickly on. Scott, what, what efforts will be undertaken to educate 
the public and workers in particular who might be affected by this uh, on these new changes in the law. Uh, well, what do you see happening in the near future? There'll be a renewed vigor to get back out into the field and try to explain this to workers. We have people like Fuesa Laboral, Jobs with Justice, who are well aware of this. Those within the building trades will be out there uh, trying to spread the word. We hopefully legal counsels will start realizing it and talk to people. We've often felt, Josh pointed out earlier, Boston's been, Massachusetts has been doing a great job of this. But as they've punished people, they've filtered down to Rhode Island. And we've seen the bad players in Massachusetts who've been booted out and refused work come down here and take work from our own contractors, Rhode Island-based contractors and our own Rhode Island-based workers. And that's been happening for a long time. Connecticut is kind of in second place. They're doing a few things that are better, and now hopefully we're on board with that. I just want to say briefly, for the layman, you know, independent contracting, I want to talk about in construction. We'll just make it very brief. Say if we're a painting contractor, we're doing this room, and there's five guys doing various aspects of painting. They're being directed by one person. We find out again and again, each one of them is being 1099. The materials are provided by the, the so-called contractor. The direction is provided by the so-called contractor. The payment is being provided by the so-called contractor, but yet they're all being classified as independent contractors. And there was a study, and I can't tell you what the amount was, but a, w there was a study that last time they studied independent contracting in construction, 60% of those who were independent contracted paid, their, uh, paid to, the IR, to the feds but didn't pay to the state taxes because they feel, you know, first of all, some of them don't even realize it, and the last thing they want to do is after they were paid, paid taxes when mm -hmm. they really shouldn't have to, and they feel, and they have been able to get away with not paying here locally, but they're a little more f fearful of the feds. So they pay to the feds, but yet we don't get the, co we don't get the money in the coffers here. So as we spread the word, and I think what Dick says is more important, we need a few big hits. We need someone to go down for the count. We need some publicity. We need mm -hmm. to show that you're not going to get away with this anymore. So I think we'll be redoubling our efforts to find those who do this on a regular basis and try to bring them to so-called justice. And hopefully that will deter others. Certainly. Senator, I, I often try and um, get the, the other side's perspective, at least in, in short form. Uh, uh, did you get some pushback from either your colleagues or or some business interests against this bill? And, and there are a few business interests that have a business model that um, depends on independent contracting. One of the models that was brought to our attention was FedEx. FedEx sends out um, every, it's almost like franchised, where every driver is an independent contractor mm -hmm. for FedEx. And so they wanted to be protected and that type of model, whether it's a good idea or not, in order to get the legislation passed, that type of business model was protected, but not to the point where it could be exploited or expanded into other workplaces. And that, the exploitation and expansion is what has um, misfigured the level playing field that is happening, especially in the building trades on a regular basis. Okay. And Dick, you had mentioned compromises. Were there any other uh, compromises that were notable in, in the, this year's legislative process? Uh, well, just to follow up on Josh, I mean, there was no real compromise on the FedEx, uh, the FedEx uh, issue, um, and, and the Teamsters, I know, feel very strongly that uh, every driver out there with a truck that's in hock to FedEx and that you wear a FedEx shirt and a FedEx process and a FedEx route that, uh, you know, can be yanked away, uh, they, they question whether that's a really a truly independent model, and I'm sure UPS, which pays all their workers as employees probably has a different uh, different uh, position on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, the, mis the, uh, the uh, definition of independent contract, the bill was kind of a casualty or a compromise of these four bills, uh, and that would have impacted FedEx. So to that extent, it was a casualty. But as to right. the bills themselves, uh, the compromises, uh, uh, the major one on the misclass in, 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 in prior right of action bill was uh, personal liability. Uh, we originally had the uh, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act definition of employer, which is rather broad, which would apply to individuals uh, involved in the payroll process uh, or the, high, uh, or the uh, uh, compensation process, uh, would have been liable as well for wage and hour violations. That was a casualty 
of the uh, compromise, not a significant one necessarily, but certainly uh, a, a casualty of it. The uh, sharing of information bill, I already went through a compromise and went through it the last minute and had an unintended consequence, mm -hmm. the probable cause and what have you, so that's got to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, the content registration board, uh, the only compromise we made was that it was clear that it couldn't be a grounds for additional penalty. This was strictly, you know, revoke, <laughs> revoke your uh, registration, no additional penalties that the contact registration board could mm -hmm. uh, meet out. And that's about it. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, you know, the penalties were fined a little bit, uh, you know, three times, two times versus three times, sure. or a $10,000 misclass, <laughs> you know, we tweaked those a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, that's, uh, probably the extent of the compromise. And that's how the, the building works, and that's how you get things done. So he makes sausage. Yeah, that's, that's right. In our remaining uh, couple of minutes, Scott, well, how, how big was this to the building construction trades? Well, this has been a few years in the making. Um, Senator Miller and Josh referred to the, the, um, the hearings on the underground um, economy a few years ago. Mm -hmm. We've been pushing hard. We've had failures. Dick has worked very hard on this for the last few years. And uh, this was, we felt really successful, very happy about this. Now we just want to see it make it work. But I also want to say I might as well pile on um, as far as um, Fed, FedEx goes. You know, this year in the art of compromise, we left behind the definition of independent contracting, which the AFL is very concerned with and the Teamsters are particularly concerned with. So we can tell our friends or not so, not really not our friends, mm -hmm. the other side that we'll be back next year mm -hmm. working on that. With the success of this, they can see us next year yeah. because we will definitely be passing the baton on. Important step forward, but the job's not done. The job's yet. not yeah. done, no way. Senator, you feel good about the passage of this bill? Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, it's not as simple as an issue or an issue that's easy, easy to explain like some of my other legislative efforts like uh, renewable energy standard. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to understand that or at least get the concept of what uh, renewable energy has in our future. Or decriminalizing marijuana, everybody understands the issue very well. Mm -hmm. This bill, I'm really proud of this type of legislation because of the impact it has towards a leveling, leveling the playing field, fairness for all contractors, and revenue for the state to uh, ally the raising of taxes as, as one example. I think it's a very significant piece of legislation, and uh, maybe at some point when people see the revenue that it creates, they'll understand its impact. Uh, Scott, Dick, and Josh, thank you all very much for your time. This was a, a very informative uh, show for a lot of people, and I think, uh, as you earlier described, getting the information out is going to be really important to the success of this legislative initiative. During our last session, we looked at the formation of one of the most influential uh, labor groups in all uh, of American labor history, and of course that was the American Federation of Labor, uh, headed up by Samuel Gompers. We saw the Knights of Labor go down, the AFL kind of took its place, but did not organize as many people, stuck to the skilled workforce rather than the unskilled, and, and let a lot of people uh, uh, loose uh, from the labor movement. There was a third grouping. Uh, of union people uh, at the time in the 1880s and the 1890s and would continue on and off right down through uh, history. And those are people whom we call in general uh, the left wing. And the left wing is made up of all uh, sorts of people, uh, some the labor people uh, want no uh, responsibility for uh, at all. Uh, one group that sometimes work with labor are of course the socialists uh, who uh, uh, tried to get uh, societal change in and make lives better for everyone legislatively. Um, on the other hand, uh, you had more radical elements coming into the United States in the 19th century. These were usually uh, revolutionaries uh, from one European country or another, uh, where they usually lost, and then in order to escape the authorities who usually executed them, uh, they came to America uh, gravitated towards uh, urban environments and often got involved uh, with unions. And you also had a, another group, a much smaller one, although uh, made up of many different components, uh, whom today we would call uh, anarchists. And once in a while you had a bomb thrower. Now these weren't union people, but uh, they often would like to affiliate themselves uh, with that. And I'll talk a little about each group just for a couple of minutes. But um, 
the socialists were very different than the uh, uh, average American worker. And uh, one immigrant uh, socialist uh, who went out to uh, the Midwest at one point to interview some uh, miners out there to see what they thought about the state of the world, um, one uh, Eastern socialist uh, out in Kingman, uh, Arizona, uh, approached a miner and uh, the, the miner said, that, said to him that it wasn't necessary to read to be a socialist and went on to say, all a fella needs to know is that he is robbed. And boy, that's a good old American worker, uh, right to the point, very pragmatic. Uh, you know, you didn't need to dress it up a lot. It was uh, uh, very unequivocal. And if you compare that uh, quotation, which is just one out of a million, uh, to some of the debates uh, that some of the leftists had, say, in New York City in the same period, around 1900, uh, they advertised one debate, and it, it went like this. It was about, and I quote, the dialectical, historical, materialistic, economic, deterministic, Marxian analysis of the exploitation of workers. Oh, my God, he, he probably lost everybody on the first two or three vocabulary uh, words. But you can see uh, that it was a whole different uh, ball game uh, by uh, and large. Now, interestingly, uh, on May 1st, 1886, through some strange alchemy, uh, the Knights of Labor, who were at the height of their power, along with the AFL, who was the new kid on the block, but was beginning to make some inroads among skilled working people, as well as the leftists, who were more militant than, say, uh, the other two groups, formed a rather unusual and brief alliance uh, in that fateful May of 1886 to fight for the eight-hour day for all of American workers, uh, regardless of which group uh, they belong to. And so when May 1st, 1886 came about, thousands, tens of thousands of American workers, particularly in large cities from California to New York and Boston and Philadelphia, New York and Chicago in particular, uh, walked out of their jobs. And uh, almost overnight, in many instances at least, particularly if they were skilled or very militant, uh, their employers capitulated right away and gave them the eight-hour day. 1886 was a long time ago uh, to get that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them who got it weren't able to keep it uh, for very long, and we'll see why uh, in just uh, a minute. There was so much labor activity in this era, again, the 1880s and the Knights of Labor and the AFL and the left wing, all doing one thing or another all around the country. Uh, there were protests, there were demonstrations, there were strikes, always some type of activity uh, going on. Nobody sat home and uh, uh, wished they had something to do uh, in that particular period. And so one night, just a couple of days after the uh, fateful and very successful May 1st demonstrations, which brought the eight-hour day into existence for the most part. Uh, a strike was going on right outside of Chicago among some agricultural implement workers, people who made machines. And on May 4th, uh, 1886, um, a protest rally was called for Haymarket Square uh, in Chicago. Now, just again, just a few days after the successful eight-hour uh, rally. But on May 3rd, uh, that strike among the agricultural workers had uh, broken into a, uh, a shootout between the police, strike bakers, and strikers themselves. And so a protest march was scheduled for the night of May 4th, 1886. Now you can see this is a very eventful week in labor history. And so that night it was uh, a very cool, uh, uh, windy, uh, rainy evening. Maybe a thousand people showed up to protest and listened to various speakers who uh, uh, stood up on a wagon. And just outside of, of uh, the crowd, the mayor of Chicago was also there, and hidden away behind a uh, building uh, was a platoon of police in case things got out of uh, order. But the mayor who listened to the uh, uh, rantings and ravings of uh, uh, 
the protest uh, speakers, um, after a while I could see that it was beginning to break up, uh, that there was really no uh, uh, threat at all. And he went over to the captain of police and told him to dismiss his officers and send them home, that uh, there was nothing about to happen that particular night. Now, psychologically speaking, we don't know what happened here. The mayor left. Uh, maybe the captain of police saw his opportunity to make a name for himself. And as the demonstrators dispersed slowly but surely, there weren't as many of them. And so the police, uh, under Captain Bonner's orders, uh, suddenly marched forward uh, towards the demonstrators in order to confront them. And in one of the most contentious and uh, controversial happenings, and it still is even to this day, as the police marched towards the demonstrators, who were very militant themselves, they turned around and started marching towards the police. You know, these were two uh, uh, forces that were bound to meet in the middle, but before they got there, somebody lofted a bomb uh, into the middle of the street, which went off, uh, killing not only policemen, but demonstrators as well. To this day, we're not really sure who threw the bomb. Was it an anarchist, uh, some lone crackpot who did it? Uh, was it the police, perhaps, and trying to set up a, a situation to make the strike and the uh, demonstrators look bad? Uh, book after book is argued one uh, way or the other. But one thing this did lead to was a tremendous dragnet throughout the city of Chicago that night, May 4th, 1886, and the following weeks uh, after it. And I would say that oh, hundreds of people were rounded up, um, sometimes because they were labor leaders, sometimes because they were leftists, uh, sometimes because they had a foreign accent. And we'll see this again in American history, uh, sadly, as well. Eventually, the police winnowed the number of uh, arrestees down to eight leaders. These were people they thought they could put on trial and perhaps get them out of the way uh, once and for all. And so, uh, in uh, 1887, 1886, 1887, the uh, leaders of, uh, of the labor movement were put on trial uh, by the attorney general uh, of the state of Illinois. And he would give the instructions to the police while they were rounding people up and said, make the raids first and look up the law afterward. Uh, I guess there were no Miranda rights back <laughs> in those days. Um, it was a setup from the beginning. Uh, the jury contained individuals who were related to some of the slain policemen. Uh, certainly a defense attorney would like to get a hold of uh, a situation like that. Uh, the media cried out for uh, uh, execution of these labor leaders. And the judge himself, before even hearing testimony, said that, that his duty would be done and these people would pay dearly for their actions, whether they were found innocent or not. The attorney general, in his instructions to the jury, would say, law is on trial, anarchy is on trial. These men have been selected, picked out by the grand jury, and indicted because they were leaders. They are no more guilty than the thousands who follow them. Gentlemen of the jury, convict these men, make examples of them, hang them, and you will save our institutions and save our society. Well, those are very strong words uh, before the jury even deliberated. And uh, so you can kind of almost guess uh, what the outcome uh, would be. But one thing about the American judicial system, uh, at times it has shining moments and at other times, uh, like in the Haymarket uh, trial, uh, it did not. And in this particular instance, they allowed, as they always did, for the defendants to come forward when they were being tried and to speak their own mind. And one of them, who was a German immigrant who had come to America named August Spies, S-P-I-E-S, -E and he said to the jury and to the judge, and it must have taken a lot of guts uh, to talk out like that, he said, if you think by hanging us you can stamp out the labor movement, 
the movement from which the downtrodden millions look for salvation. If this is your opinion, then hang us. Here you will tread upon a spark, but there and there, here and in front of you and in back of you, flames will blaze up. It is a subterranean fire. You cannot put it out. And of course, what he was referring to is that working people were not treated uh, uh, very well and that they could hang as many as they wanted. Uh, they could do whatever they wanted to uh, uh, leaders and the rank and file. People would come back and fight another day. In the long run, uh, in November of 1887, a year after the event, four of the what would be known as the Haymarket Martyrs were hanged uh, in Chicago. Uh, three others were given life sentences, and a fourth allegedly committed suicide in prison by biting on a dynamite cap. Uh, that always seems very uh, suspicious uh, as well. An unbelievable quarter of a million people turned out for the funeral march, uh, as these people were uh, buried outside of uh, Chicago in what has become a great uh, tourist stop, at least for labor people, uh, called Waldheim Cemetery. And um, it became, uh, uh, as I said, one of the most controversial decisions ever in American history. And in 1893, uh, the new governor of Illinois, his name was John Peter Altgeld. He was a German immigrant himself, but was very popular with uh, uh, the people in and around Illinois, was elected governor. And one of the first things he did was to reopen that case he published uh, an expose of it. He let the last remaining prisoners who had not been executed free. He posthumously pardoned those who had been executed and said that we'll probably never know who threw that bomb. And to this day, uh, it's still uh, up in the air. But in employer circles, John Peter Altgelt, the governor of Illinois, became one of the most hated men uh, in all of American history because of his actions on the part of labor. And by the way, there were demonstrations in Providence uh, around this particular uh, issue. Now, one quote I use in my class, and it's, it's just one out of many, and I, I suppose you pick out the ones that are most germane, but a businessman was, was uh, uh, stopped by a uh, newspaper reporter in Chicago at the time of the hangings, and when he was asked about the situation, he said, I don't consider these people, the Haymarket Martyrs, to be guilty of any offense, but they must be hanged. I am not afraid of anarchy. Oh, no, it's the utopian scheme of a few philanthropic cranks. But I do consider that the labor movement must be crushed. The Knights of Labor will never dare to create discontent again if these men are hanged. Of course, the Knights of Labor had nothing to do uh, with the Haymarket bombing. Uh, they weren't involved. Uh, they were there a few days earlier with the uh, eight-hour demonstration, but not for this particular event. And uh, really, they used it to uh, uh, blackball and to uh, exploit and to go after uh, the Knights of Labor, the largest union group in America uh, at uh, the particular time. Um, at about the... Um, same time uh, that the Haymarket situation was going on in uh, uh, the 1880s. Uh, there was uh, an incredible uh, uh, American-born uh, leftist named Eugene Victor Debs, who came from Terre Haute, Indiana. That's where he was born, of French parents. Uh, any of you ever been out that way? His home is still uh, on the National Historical Site. Um, he's out in Larry Bird country, for those of you in the, the basketball. Uh, you can visit the, uh, uh, the tavern right near uh, the Debs' home that Larry Bird still owns, I believe. Um, Eugene Victor Debs went to high school. You have to remember that in the uh, era of the Gilded Age, very few working people went to elementary school. That's why we had child labor. That's why the AFL fought for legislation to keep kids in school so they could have a better life. But Debs, because his parents brought him up reading to him in, uh, in kind of an intellectual atmosphere, 
um, actually went to high school for a while and later went on to business school, uh, if you can believe it. But he also went to work at a young age in order to help his family make ends meet. And he was a locomotive paint scraper for the brotherhood of locomotive firemen. This was one of the most prestigious uh, labor unions in American history. Uh, to be in the railroad brotherhoods was like being in the Pilots Association today. You were the creme de la creme. You were the aristocracy of labor. And so Debs uh, got very much involved in, in all of that um, early in his life. Even though he only made 50 cents a day, uh, the union job uh, wasn't a, a bad one. And he got involved because of his ability to, to write and to read and to speak uh, with the local union. And he rose through that to become the corresponding secretary, uh, later the president. Um, he would eventually run for the city council in Terre Haute, and he won. And believe it or not, he won with votes from the working class wards as well as the business wards. He then got elected to the legislature uh, in Indiana, and he became second in command of the Brotherhood of Locomotive uh, Firemen, becoming secretary treasurer in the 1880s. He was called by the local newspaper, which was not a working class newspaper, the blue-eyed boy of destiny. They saw him as another Abraham Lincoln because of his natural abilities to move people uh, with his orations and with his uh, uh, studies. Now, he stayed with the uh, Brotherhood for, for a number of years, but they were so conservative, and so was Debs to begin with. Uh, he opposed some of those early strikes, a uh, national strike in 1877. He was against the, the Haymarket uh, eight-hour day uh, rally. Um, he was a very conservative young man. But over time, he saw that corporations were not keeping their end of the bargain uh, in this kind of gentleman's agreement between labor and management. And as he saw labor getting pushed around more and more, and some of the unions not doing enough about it, he became radicalized uh, himself and um, finally quit the Brotherhood in 1892. And in 1894, formed the American Railway Union, one of the most unbelievable groups in all of American labor history. And I say unbelievable for this reason. Debs would allow anyone who worked on the railroad to be in the union. You didn't have to be skilled or unskilled or anything else. All you had to do was receive a check from the trains, and you could be a member of the American Railway Union, where the other brotherhoods were very exclusive, like the AFL. Uh, Debs also did something to the corporations, in this case the railroads, that was often done to the unions, and that is he used a legal strategy to fight them. Uh, in 1893, there was a, a major railroad strike against James Hill, one of the great uh, uh, railroad barons on his great northern railroad. A guy named Charles Pillsbury. If you've ever heard of the Pillsbury Doughboy, the ads are still on TV, been around for a long time. Charles Pillsbury was the greatest uh, uh, shipper uh, using James Hill's northern railroad. His produce was rotting in the freight cars. Debs went around the owner, James Hill, went right to Pillsbury and said, listen, this is what we want. We're not asking for much. If you could work out a deal with the owner, we'll have your produce to market in a day. And that's just what Pillsbury did. He intervened. And labor finally had a legislative and legal victory which had never been seen before, and which was the cause of thousands of people rushing into the American Railway Union, just like they did with the Knights of Labor earlier. And sometimes this is uh, not always the best thing that happened here. The other thing that uh, Debs would do uh, in 1894 uh, is that the Union Pacific Railroad, the first transcontinental railroad between the Pacific Coast and the Atlantic Coast, uh, had been formed in 1869, went bankrupt in the 1890s. And when they did, the judge intervened and said there would be 
no payments to the union, that they could not be a party to the bankruptcy proceedings. Deb's got a lawyer, went to court, and got the judge's decision overturned. This was unheard of in American labor history in the 1890s or any time before. Unions working people under dramatic and dynamic leadership, using the system itself in a law-abiding and legal way to get things straightened out for themselves. So Eugene Victor Debs uh, became not only the blue-eyed boy of destiny, he became the first working-class hero in American history. Now, you might say, what happened? And uh, it wasn't pleasant what happened. Just like the Knights of Labor, working people were attracted to these new groups that were able to show immediate successes. Workers who made Pullman Palace cars, these were moving uh, hotels in a way that they attached to the railroads. George Pullman was a great entrepreneur outside of Chicago. He made these cars, he rented them out to the railroads, he wouldn't sell them. This way he always had money coming in. The work is in 1894, when this new recession hit that I talked about earlier, a depression really, uh, went on strike, and they petitioned the American Railway Union, which was holding its convention that year in Chicago, to join. Now, Deb said you had to have a check from a union in order to be a member, which would seem to exclude them, except on the property of the Pullman Works, they had a small railroad in order to test the Pullman cars. They used that as an excuse to join. Debs was against it. He felt the union was too new in its infancy that they wouldn't be able to take on uh, organized capital. And what happened is that he was overruled by the delegates. Uh, they joined the Pullman strikers. And eventually, the United States government called out the federal troops, thousands of them, uh, sent them into Chicago, and basically, uh, as we saw with the Knights of Labor, shot the Union back to work. And by the way, Debs was a total pacifist. Uh, there was no uh, violence uh, on, on, on behalf of the uh, Union. Because of his activities, uh, Debs was tried, as was the entire executive board of the American Railway Union, and he was sent to prison for six months and spent his sentence in the same jail as the Haymarket Martyrs in Chicago, where people say he had some tough dreams uh, and came out of there uh, an avowed radical, very different from when he went in. He felt that he had played by the rules and been slapped in the face uh, by the legal community uh, because of that. And so we'll see that although the American Railway Union is broken, although Debs goes to uh, a prison, he goes on a speaking tour after that, and later is involved in forming this very mainline socialist party, and in 1912 runs for president of the United States and gets a million votes. And I'm sure that most of his votes were encountered. Uh, back in those days, uh, things were a little shoddy. Debs got 8, 10% of the popular vote, which was amazing, and uh, they became kind of the political party of working people for a while. And so in our next session, we'll see uh, the emergence of another group, the Industrial Workers of the World. We'll see how they work with the uh, uh, American Federation of Labor uh, and the Socialist Party and uh, what happens in World War I. Again, thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week. Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m.